We're delighted uh, that all of you could come to the conference and we'll kick off with the first paper, which is uh, by Dorona Chimoliu, David Otter, and Christina Patterson, Bottleneck Sectoral Imbalances and the U.S. Productivity Slowdown. And we should say that the authors have 20 minutes and each discussant has 20 minutes and then the remaining 20 minutes will be for general discussion. Great. Uh, well, thank you so much um, uh, to the organizers for including us as part of this uh, conference. I'm excited to kick off the day, um, as Valerie said, with work bottleneck sectoral imbalances and the U.S. productivity slowdown. Okay. Uh, great. Uh, so a key um, feature of innovation over the last several decades has been a large surge in innovation in uh, ICT and computer and electronics in particular. So this figure here shows you a glimpse of that rise. You can see in the green line, there was this huge surge in total patenting uh, after around the 1980s. And that coincided with a large rise in the fraction of total patents that come from just these two sectors. This has suggested to some that maybe we're on the edge of kind of a new era of abundance on the verge of kind of the singularity coming from these uh, kind of high super intelligent uh, computers. But this explosion in innovation on this dimension has also coincided with relatively lackluster productivity growth overall. So I'm plotting here TFP uh, overall in blue and in manufacturing in uh, orange. This is for the US. Um, and you can see the kind of much documented decline uh, in productivity, especially over the last several decades. This suggests to others that maybe our, our best ideas are behind us and we're in sort of a new age of, of slower growth. So in this paper, we're gonna put forward a new hypothesis that tries to reconcile these two facts. And our hypothesis is going to be that tech, uneven technological advances across sectors can create endogenous bottlenecks that can kind of hold back aggregate productivity. We're going to have a simple theoretical framework uh, wherein if, uh, uh, if inputs are comp, uh, should I, let me just pause there and write again, it keeps popping up. Um, but if inputs are complementary to each other, then new technologies are going to require simultaneous improvements in several of their inputs at the same time. So for example, think of the automotive industry. We're not gonna get huge advances in technology in cars with just advances in things like sensors or software, but we also need simultaneous advances in things like tires or batteries. And if one of these, say batteries, is lagging behind, then we can get explosive productivity growth in some part without having aggregate productivity growth overall. And the batteries in that case of the car industry are endogenous in that they became a bottleneck as things like software and sensors uh, sort of took off. And so the bulk of the paper then is going to be to try to provide some empirical evidence uh, for this hypothesis. And across an array of specifications, we're going to find evidence that greater dispersion in an industry's supplier's productivity growth um, has a large negative uh, effect on an own uh, industry's productivity growth. So the plan for today um, is that I'm going to uh, first go over the motivating theoretical framework to sort of formalize our hypothesis a bit more. I'll talk about the data we're going to use, and I'm going to spend the bulk of the time talking about some empirical evidence for these patterns. So the motivating theoretical framework, uh, I don't know why this keeps popping up. Uh, the motive, so our goal here is to derive estimating equations that link an industry's productivity growth um, to the distribution of productivity growth among the industries that supply to them. So we're going to consider here an economy with n sectors that are producing some output using a constant returns to scale production function, where they're producing with labor, with intermediate inputs X from a set of supplying industries S, and they're going to have some productivity A. The key part here is going to be how productivity evolves. We're going to build on and extend some of Jerome's previous work with Pablo Azar, and we're going to introduce a quality ladder structure here, where innovations are going to increase N, are going to increase productivity by a factor lambda. And the critical assumption we're going to be thinking about here is that the arrival rate of innovation, denoted here by phi, is going to depend on the distribution of productivity among your supplying industries. So the functions here, H, big H and little h, are going to be monotone functions that are going to capture the nature of that relationship. So if little h is convex, that's going to mean uh, that uh, the inputs are substitutes in production. And so innovation is going to be determined by the most advanced inputs. If instead there's like a little h function here is concave, the inputs are going to be complements to each other and greater dispersion and productivity among your suppliers is going to hinder your own innovation. You can see that clearly if you take a Taylor expansion of that expression, 
where you can denote innovation here uh, as a function of the average, the cost-weighted average productivity growth among your input, uh, productivity of your inputs, and the cost-weighted variance of the productivity among your inputs. Since little h and big H, we had our monotone functions, the average is always going to enter positively. Uh, more innovation among your inputs leads to more innovation for you. Um, but the term on the variance is going to depend on the shape of that H function. And in the bottleneck hypothesis would be the concave case. It's going to say conditional on the average productivity of your, of your uh, inputs, um, a, a greater dispersion is going to hold you back. So that's the theoretical equation. We're going to estimate something in the data that looks very similar, where we're going to relate the growth of TFP in an industry to the average growth of TFP among their suppliers, uh, again, weighted by their input shares, and the variance of that uh, growth among their suppliers. When we construct these, we're gonna leave out the own input share to get rid of that mechanical correlation. And in, in addition to adding some controls and an error term, the two differences of this equation relative to the theoretical equation are that, well, first, we're using TFP as our measure of innovation. And second, since TFP is not interpretable in levels, we're going to be looking at consecutive five-year changes in the growth rate of TFP. And just to summarize here, our hypothesis is that the beta term is going to be positive, uh, but that the variance term uh, will, will enter negatively. So that's what we're going to take with us to the data. A brief overview of the data we're going to be using. Well, we need to know who your suppliers are. For that, we're going to use the input-output linkages. This is going to be the detailed input-output tables from 1977 to 2002. We're going to get measures of, of uh, TFP and manufacturing uh, from the NBRCS manufacturing database. This is going to be very granular. It's going to give us 462 1997 NAICS industries, um, and we're going to use data from 1977 to 2007. We're going to supplement this with uh, TFP from non-manufacturing industries. This will be 42 uh, 1997 NAICS industries between 1987 and 2007. I'm going to mostly focus on the US, but I'll show you some results using international patterns. And for that, we'll get TFP from CLEMS for uh, nine countries and 30 industries, um, also from 1987 to 2007. And then we're going to supplement these TFP measures with more direct measures of innovation that come from patenting. And so in particular, we're going to focus mostly on the US PTO patents. This is going to give us patenting at the firm and CPC level, that's industry patent class. Um, using data from 1976 to 2014. We're going to get linkages across those patent classes coming from the network of patent citations. And as I said, most of what I'm going to show you is going to be using uh, U.S. Uh, patents, but I'll show you some international specifications. And for those, we'll be getting the international patenting from the Google Patents Global Patent Database from the same time period. Okay. So on to some of the, the, uh, the uh, empirical evidence. I'm going to first show you our first evidence for these uh, bottleneck patterns visually. So I'm going to show you this here, which is showing the relationship between industry TFP growth and the average TFP growth of your suppliers. So on the y-axis, I'm going to zoom in on just that coefficient. On the y-axis, I have an industry's TFP growth where I've residualized out your fixed effects and the variance of TFP growth among your suppliers. On the x-axis, I have average TFP growth, where I've done the same residualization. Um, and this is a bin scatter. So each plot here is 2% of the data, not an individual industry by year. And you can see here that there's a pretty strong positive relationship. On average, when your suppliers are more productive, so are you. This contrasts with the variance here, where now on the y-axis, I again have a, your industry TFP growth. But now I've residualized it for those time fixed effects and the average TFP growth of your supplier. And similarly, on the x-axis, I have the variance of supplier TFP growth residualized in the same way. So this shows us that conditional on the average TFP growth of your suppliers, having a greater dispersion of TFP growth uh, is a negative predictor of your TFP growth. This table here just formalizes exactly what we just saw in those bin scatter plots. You can see here that on average, when your, uh, your supplying industries uh, have higher productivity growth, so do you, but conditional on that average, a higher variance exerts a negative uh, draw. So that's for manufacturing. That's what I just showed you in the bin scatters. We can add in the non-manufacturing industries and we find very similar patterns for this kind of wider swath of the economy. Now, in addition to these being kind of statistically significant, we also find that this bottleneck pattern could kind of meaningfully contribute uh, to the decline in aggregate productivity that we see uh, over the last recent decades. 
Now, for this to be the case, it has to both be that the magnitude of these coefficients is meaningfully large and that there was a rise in the variance uh, of TFP growth um, among the suppliers. This figure shows that that was indeed the case. So it's plotting the variance of uh, supplier TFP growth. Um, and what we see here is that this, uh, this measure kind of more than doubled um, between 1977 uh, and 2007. And if you do a simple back of the envelope uh, using that, you can see that our regression estimates uh, imply that a kind of substantial um, uh, fraction of the decline and uh, the slowdown of productivity can be explained by this rising variance. So in particular, in the green bars here, what I'm showing you is a simple back of the envelope of what our estimates imply the growth rate of TFP would have been if the variance of supplier TFP growth had stayed the same as it was in 1977 to 1987. And what you see here is that between 1997 and 2007, our estimates imply that TFP growth would have been almost as high as it was um, uh, in the initial period and around four percentage points higher than it was in reality. This is just to show you that these bottleneck patterns are kind of relatively robust to a battery of alternate specifications. So I'm showing you here just the coefficient of interest, which is the, the coefficient on the variance of um, uh, your supplier TFP, although all of these are from specifications where we're also controlling for the average. The top estimate here is the baseline estimate. And you can see here we find kind of a large and negative coefficient uh, in alternate specifications uh, where we control for uh, different things. We use tenure changes, we drop computers, um, and uh, in particular in the bottom estimate here where we control for the average and the variance of supplier prices or quantities. Now, since TFP is not a direct measure of innovation, you might think maybe we're capturing some neoclassical effects where you do better if your uh, suppliers are more productive because you face lower prices. Uh, and what we show here is if you control for this, uh, you find a similar estimate suggesting that's that's not what's going on here. I want to highlight another robustness check, uh, which is that uh, addressing the fact that we are regressing TFP on kind of the contemporaneous TFP among your suppliers. And so you might be concerned that kind of common productivity shocks across those two sectors could cause some mechanical correlation. And so we thought that isolating productivity changes that are common across several advanced economies might partially weigh against this concern. So to that end, we're going to show a specification here where we instrument the mean and variance of the supplier TFP growth with the mean and variance of those uh, supplying industries TFP growth, but in France, Germany, and the UK. And when you do that, I plotted what you get here. Again, this is just uh, the, the term on the variance. The top two are our baseline estimates, the OLS and the IV. The bottom are the estimates if we include industry uh, fixed effects. And in both cases, you see that the IV and the OLS estimates uh, are relatively similar, um, suggest kind of leaning against the possibility that these are really driven by correlated shocks across industries. So those were the evidence and the patterns we saw for TFP. Um, and as you saw in our motivating framework, the, the mechanism we have in mind that drives these, uh, these patterns are that this is coming from innovation. So what we're going to do next is we're going to repeat many of the specifications we did with TFP, but using a more direct measure of innovation that comes from patenting. So what I'm showing you here are bin scatter plots that are analogous to what I showed you for TFP, but I'm replacing the growth rate of TFP with the growth rate of patenting. I'm replacing an industry uh, with a patent class or a CPC code. And I'm replacing the input output network with a patent citation network. So instead of being a supplier, you're being an idea supplier. And, uh, and so the suppliers are going to be to you in terms of the idea space are going to be those patent classes uh, that you cite uh, in your patents. So on the left, we have the plot that shows the relationship with the average and on the right, the one with the variance, each of them kind of residualizing out each other. So what we see on the left um, is that uh, there's a strong relationship on average. So if the patent classes that you cite uh, are growing a lot, um, you have a large patent growth as well. However, on the right, we see that conditional on that average, if there's a greater dispersion of patenting growth among the CPC classes that you cite, uh, that's going to be a negative predictor of your patenting growth um, as well. Again, zooming in on some robustness, I'm going to focus on, on the coefficient of interest, which is on the right-hand side there. Here, uh, the top one is the baseline that we were just looking at in that bin scatter. And these are kind of what it looks like in an array of alternate specifications. I want to highlight maybe two things here. The first is the one that looks a little less robust. Uh, that's the one where we drop computers. 
So unlike in the case of TFP, computers seem to be playing a particularly important role here. And then lastly, I want, secondly, I want to highlight the specification at the bottom, which is a specification where we've instrumented the upstream, uh, the kind of uh, idea supplier um, uh, average and variance in the US uh, with similar moments um, using patenting in different countries. And we find that while the standard errors are a bit larger, uh, the, the coefficient remains relatively similar. Now with the patent data, we can also disaggregate further to the level of the firm. And so these are again our now familiar bin scatter plots, but instead of the dependent variable being the patent level, patent class level uh, growth in patenting, this is the firm level growth in patenting. So the left panel is telling you that firms that uh, when the CPC codes that the firm cites in their patents are growing a lot, uh, that predicts uh, more patenting at the firm level. And the right panel saying conditional on that, though, uh, when there's a greater dispersion uh, in the patenting growth among the CPC classes that the firm cites, that's going to be kind of a negative predictor of the firm's patenting growth. Again, we can zoom in and kind of probe the robustness of those results. We see that they're largely uh, robust to different specifications, and I want to just highlight the second one here which is the one where we add CPC by year uh, fixed effects. And thus what we're isolating the bottleneck patterns from are two firms within that kind of tend to patent within the same CPC class, but have a distri different distribution uh, of patent citations. Um, and we see that uh, the, the patterns are remarkably uh, similar. All right, in the last minute then, I want to zoom out and show some international patterns that suggest uh, that these bottlenecks can also uh, have contributed to the international uh, slowdown uh, in productivity. So to do that, we'll start with TFP. We're going to use the world input output table, um, as well as TFP measures from CLEMS uh, across nine European countries and 30 industries. Um, and we're going to be looking, calculating the uh, average and variance now across not just industries, but industries and countries um, uh, that supply uh, to a given uh, sector within a country. And we find here patterns that look remarkably similar. So when the industries and countries uh, that are supply to you have a faster TFP growth, that predicts higher, higher TFP growth for you. But conditional on that average, the variance, a kind of wider dispersion, uh, it exerts a negative influence. This is true in panel one when we're looking across all industries and countries. And it's also true in column two, where we add a set of year by industry fixed effects and we're just isolating the variation uh, that comes across countries. We can also do an analogous specification here where we use patents. Here we are gonna use patenting growth uh, across 633 CPC codes as before. And here we're gonna be using the 20 countries that have the most patenting in the uh, Google uh, global patenting database. And we see patterns that are also broadly consistent uh, with, the, with the bottleneck hypothesis here, both in column three when looking across all CPCs and countries and when looking kind of just within a CPC across countries as well. So I think I'm almost out of time, so I'll leave it there. These are kind of new and striking, we think striking facts uh, about the dispersion of productivity and innovation uh, among a sector's kind of uh, suppliers, um, either input suppliers or idea suppliers, and that own uh, industries uh, growth uh, in productivity. Our interpretation is that these represent potentially causal relationships that are reflective of the cost of an imbalance of innovation across sectors. It leads to the natural question of kind of why this happened. Was this inevitable? Is this sort of the way the innovation possibility frontier uh, shifted out? Or does it reflect um, potentially a divergence between kind of the social value uh, of innovation uh, and the private cost of innovation? And if it's the latter, uh, then it could suggest that the productivity slowdown could be the result um, of, of some sort of market failure. So I'll leave it there. Uh, and we're really looking forward to the discussions.